Okay, let's start. Uh, so, looks like uh, some people started the Thanksgiving vacation already. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, we'll... Uh, okay, so, so where are we? So, before where we are, so just to remind you, project reports are today. Uh, please keep it short, you know, one or two pages just to tell yourself and me uh, where you are, what kind of problems you're having, what kind of changes you've made, um, and any difficulties. Uh, as I said last time, the final exam is in, I think, three weeks or something like that, in class. Uh, I asked about a review last time, and everyone seemed to be uh, interested in a review although there was at least one message in Piazza as of last night that says maybe not a review. So I'm, I'm happy to entertain uh, options. So just, you know, send me email or, or write something in Piazza and, and I'll, uh, I'll see what uh, most of you uh, are interested in. Questions? Suggestions? Okay. So... Ah. Okay. So, so we are talking about base nets. Um, and we basically defined and played a little bit with, with base net, which is a key way to represent distribution. Not the only way, not necessarily the best way, uh, because depending on what you really care about, you may want to represent things uh, differently. In fact, my perspective on this is that BaseNet uh, was the, mo the first and most commonly used representation of probability distribution, mostly uh, because it's comprehensible. As you could see when we, when we looked at examples uh, last time, we, we saw things like this, where you can really understand what's happening and read off the dependencies and independencies from, from this representation, which is a nice thing about it. Nowadays, that most of the work that we are doing uh, with probability distribution, we don't actually write down the probability distribution this way, but rather we learn it from data. Uh, in some contexts, the significance of being comprehensible is, is less important. So you could use other representation that have advantages other than comprehensibility. For example, multilinear representations of distributions that are more algebraic expressions um, are not as comprehensible, but inference with them is easier. But anyhow, we, we are talking about BaseNet. This is certainly the most important representation. And we talked about uh, what does it mean? How do you read the assumptions from the network. Uh, and we talked a little bit about inference. So it's hard in the worst case. In fact, even approximate inference is hard uh, in the worst case. A lot of work on both these questions and a lot of things that we know uh, about this. But all you need to know is that you can do inference. Uh, on tree, you can easily do it. It's, it's very efficient. And we hopefully I convince you that you can write it down yourself. We ran through one um, important exact inference algorithm, a variable elimination. And I also said that there exist uh, approximate algorithms, but we didn't have time to get into it. Um, but the important thing is that everything is rather simple uh, application of uh, base rule to, uh, product rule. Questions on this? Okay. So, so we want to talk about learning. Um, so we are going to talk about learning of three dependent distributions, uh, mostly because uh, that's what we can do efficiently. Uh, and uh, there's a very nice, very simple uh, algorithm uh, to do this. So. I, I just want to point out that you can really think about a tree-dependent distribution as an 
as a, an extension or generalization of naive base, right? So the only difference is that I've added additional layers, right? So in naive base, we had only the leaves and a root node. Now we have additional layers. Uh, how many parameters did you need when you wanted to learn naive base? If n is the number of nodes, how many parameters do you need when you learn naive base? Yeah, n times the number of values each variable can take. So let's assume it's two Boolean variables. So anyhow, it's linear, right? It's linear in the number of variables. So this is something to keep in mind when we move to trees, which is kind of the simplest extension we can think of, and see how many parameters we'll need today. Uh, and then we'll think about whether this is important or not. But anyhow, the learning problem that we have uh, is... We're given data. For now, we're going to assume that this is sampled from a tree-dependent distribution. Uh, and I want you to think about what does it mean. Uh, and it's useful to think about it and go back to what we've done when we talked about learning classifiers, where we had hypothesis spaces and function spaces. So... Think about this, and we're going to get to it uh, in a few seconds. So, so really, the way we think about it is there is a generative model here. So, so there exists a distribution. Let's assume, as I'm assuming here, that this is itself a tree-dependent distribution, and it generates data. Okay? So basically, someone sits there and, and tosses some coins. First, tosses a coin according to P of Y. Then, given the value of Y, tosses a coin based on P of W given Y, and then P of S given Y, and P of Z given Y, and so on. And once you see the value of Z, given the value of Z, tosses coins for X and for T. Right? So that's what we have. And this way we generated data. And we generated a lot of data. We assume that each data item is independent. And then the question is, give me back the tree. Or give me back a tree. And the question is, what do we mean? And um, so, really, what we mean in all these cases is find the most likely tree given the data, which is this. The, we compute the probability of the tree given the data. We use Bayes' rule, and then we're going to essentially argmax over this. Uh, we are going to assume, because we don't have any other way to, to make another assumption, that we have uniform distribution over trees, and therefore, really, we want to care about maximizing P of D given T. Right? That's, again, standard. Same thing that we've done over the last uh, couple of weeks. So the maximum likelihood tree is the argmax over all trees of P of D given T. And this is uh, argmax over T of P under T of the data, X1 up to Xn, and product over all data, because we, as we said, the data was sampled independently. So now you understand why we need the notion of inference before. We have to be able to produce the, uh, the probability of events, and this is what, uh, what it ends up. Now notice that in our case here, uh, what's the parent set of Xi? Just one single node, right? It's a tree. So uh, it's simple. And no, notice also that I'm abusing the notation. I'm going to do this repeatedly. Uh, I'm just writing as the product of P of Xi given the parent of Xi, even though for one node there's no parents. So think about for this specific node that is just P of the node, for the root node. Okay. So, so really... You should write this down for naive base, and you'll convince yourself that what you've done for naive base is really finding the most likely probability distribution. Uh, and again, it basically boils down to just writing down uh, the joint and 
the assumptions. Okay, so let's, let's take the following example. So here is a distribution over four variables. A distribution is just a table, right? So for each of the 16 uh, instances, I tell you what's the probability of this instance. So that's a representation of a probability distribution. Here is another representation, in fact, almost a representation. I need to give you some numbers. But once I give you these numbers concretely, this is a probability distribution. And here is another one. And last time, we ended by asking a couple of questions. So one question you can ask, are these representation of the same distribution? What does this mean, to be a representation of the same distribution? I mean, it looks differently. It could still be the same or not? What's the definition of these two distinct creatures, you know, one that has, you know, these uh, arrows and nodes and another one that has numbers in a table? They look different. Can they be the same probability distribution? If so, what does it mean? Yeah? Okay, so, so you're suggesting that in order to determine whether the tree, I'm going to give you exact number for P of X4, for P of X3 given X4 and so on, that whether this tree represents the same distribution as this depends on the assumptions. Okay, I'm looking for something more basic than this. Yes? then it means that the probability distributions are the same. Okay, so this is really the, the, the simplest uh, definition that I wanted, right? So basically, the joints are the same. Take a point, x1, x2, x3, x4. If for all points, x1, x2, x3, x4, p1 of this point is the same as p2 of this point, it's the same probability distribution. And now, in the case of 1, I actually gave you the numbers. In the case of 2, you'll have to write it down, but you know how to write it down, right? P of x1, x2, x3, x4 is, you know how to write the joint, right? It's P of x4 times P of x1 given x4, and so on. You can write it down, write an expression. I'm going to give you everything you need, and tell me whether it's the same or not. So, so basically, you don't need any uh, theory here. All you need is to really think about what does it mean to be the same probability distribution. And, and we're going to actually do this uh, in a second or something similar to it. Uh, okay, so here I gave you three probability distribution, and I can ask you these questions, and I can also ask you, given a sample, three points, or 17 points, if it's 17, I'll have some repetitions here, but... Uh, I can ask you which of this distribution has generated the data. Or I should probably ask you, tell me, is more likely to have generated the data. All right, so here are three points. Which of uh, this distribution uh, has generated? So, so what about probability distribution one? Do you think it could have generated it? Yes, no? Some people think no. Why? Okay, so, so the likelihood, because you see that this point, 1, 0, 0, 0, the support probability distribution 1 give on it, uh, where was it? Uh, 1, 0, 0, 0. Where is it? I lost it. This one. The support under probability distribution 1 is 0, 
This one actually could not have generated it. Again, we're going to make this a little bit more concrete, and you should be able to make it concrete. You can ask yourself, what's the likelihood of this probability distribution generating this data point? And you will see that it's zero. And you can do the same computation for all the other two, and, and this is what we're going to do now. So what's the likelihood that this table generated the data? So I'm going to compute the, compute the probability of the table given the data. Now we know how to do this. It's the probability of the data given the table times P of T divided by P of D. And in this case, as you observe, the probability of 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1 given the table is 0. And therefore, the product over all three data points here is also going to be 0. This table did not generate this sample. What about the other two? So here, I actually need to give you the concrete numbers. So here are the numbers. Uh, this set of seven numbers is sufficient to define the probability distribution. Right? You agree with me? And not only it's sufficient, now I can compute the likelihood of uh, this probability distribution, this three, given the data. And I'm going to do it this way. So for each point, P of 1, 0, 1, 1, given the three, so th that's what I get here. So in this point, x4 is, I'm starting by writing it this way. So it's p of x4. I'm using the independence assumption. So it's p of x4 times p of x1 given x4, p of x2 given x4, p of x3 given x4. So now I'm just substituting number, p of x1 being 1. That's the point. p of x1 being 1 given that x4 is 1 x2 is 0 given x4 is 1, and so on. And I'm just putting the numbers here. Notice that um, what I gave you here is only p of xi being 1 given 1 and given 0. But when I have this, uh, p of x2 being 0, I also know it, right? Because it's 1 minus p of x1 given x4 being 1, right? So that's hopefully trivial enough and I computed the probability of this data. And I can do the same thing for the other data points. And that means that I know what's the probability that this data was generated by these three. Turns out to be this small number. I can do the same thing for this three. A little bit different, right? It's different because I'm writing the joint in a different way. I don't know if it's really different. Could be the same. In fact, in a new problem set, you're going to prove that sometimes trees that look differently actually are the same. Um, so uh, here's another tree. Here I need to write it as p of x4 times p of x1 given x4, p of x2 given x4, p of x3 given x2. All right? Slightly different numbers I need. So these are the numbers that you need here. Uh, and I, again, I can write this down, multiplying over all data points. Uh, and I can write it down. I get another small number. Look at these three numbers. It so happens that distribution 2 is the most likely distribution to have produced the data. OK? So what have we done here? We actually solved the learning problem from trees because we found the most likely distribution, but we solved it in a very, very specific, si simple case. So, so if you, we want to go back to what we've done uh, a couple of weeks ago, it's really analogous to the first problem that we solved when we talked about maximum likelihood, where I gave you two coins. One was a bias coin, one was a 0.6, 0.7 coin, let's say, and I ask you, toss it once or toss it a hundred times, which one of them is more likely? So basically, you computed for each coin the likelihood of this data being produced and compared. That's the problem we solved now, only that we solved it for a slightly more uh, involved way of producing the data. Instead of just tossing coin, we had some tree that generated the data. But that's really not 
the general problem. What's the general problem I want to solve? Just like in the coin, right? So, suggestion? Of, right, so just like in the coin where giving you two options was a naive way of looking at the problem, really, here's a coin, I have no idea what's the bias of the coin, find what's the most likely value of the bias, and we had to figure out a way to search over all possible values between 0 and 1. Same thing here, right? So here, uh, I will not get a small number of trees, but rather I get find a tree. So I need to figure out a way to uh, search over all space of trees and find the most likely tree, which is really just like the, the coin with P in the interval 0, 1. So that's, that's the problem we're after. Okay. So that's what we're, we're going to try to give, a systematic way to search this family of distributions. Okay. Um, so, so there's one other uh, thing that I want to say here. Uh, hopefully we understand this already. That there's, I don't know that we can find the target distribution. Right? Maybe there isn't this notion. Uh, so the goal is, is as, as before, to produce generalization. Because you could have said, when I showed you these three points, you could have give me, given me in a very, very simple way a probability distribution that has generated this data. What would be the simplest probability distribution that could have generated this data? Yeah? So, so I have a probability distribution over 16 instances, right? Four variables, two to the four. I'm going to put a probability that is, let's say, equal over these three points or any other non-zero on these three points and zero on all the others. This could have generated this data. But it's a very uninteresting probability distribution. And again, if we go back to what we've done with learning classifiers, when we talked about even first week of the class, badges problem, one of the solutions that you proposed was Take the table, use this as your model, as your classifier. It's a good classifier. It's consistent with the data, but it doesn't do any generalization. Same game we can do here, but it's an uninteresting game. So what we're doing instead, we are making some assumptions, and under these assumptions, we're going to take this data and learn a representation that in this case, we cannot say consistent because it's a kind of weaker notion, but that could have produced this data. But it will also say yes on other data points, right? It will support other data points. That, that's what we're after. And we have to make assumptions. And the assumptions we're going to make here is three dependent distributions. Okay, so that, that's really important to understand. And here's one other thing that I want you to think about that, again, goes back to the previous. So uh, the previous discussion that we had on classifier. So I could have defined the learning problem in two different ways. One way, here is data. Someone told me that it was sampled from a tree-dependent distribution. Find the most probable tree-dependent distribution that could have generated this data. Problem one. Any suggestion for a generalization of this problem? <coughs> yeah? Just find the most likely uh, structure that isn't fixed to be a tree. Okay, so I can generalize. Actually, I have two arguments in this, in this piece of text, right? So one is the generating distribution, and the other one is the one I'm learning. In this case, the way I stated it here, both of them are tree-dependent distributions. So you're suggesting take the second one, the most polar find the most polar tree representation of the distribution, and eliminate the tree from there. 
find the most probable uh, representation of the distribution. Could be any base net. What's the other extension that I can have? Yeah? Right, so I can relax instead the first part, which is assume to be sampled from a tree dependent distribution. I could say assume to be sampled from a distribution. And I'm going to keep the second argument as is find the most probable tree dependent distribution of the distribution. Of course, I could relax both. W what does this remind you? Yeah? So, so remember, when we talked about learning classifiers, we also played the same game. We started by saying, here's a concept class. Let's say linear functions. And I'm going to learn a linear function. Under this assumption, we, we talked about consistency, because there was a chance for us to learn something that is consistent with the data. But then you complained and said, you know, what if you don't know where is the data coming from? It's coming from something. Nevertheless, we said, okay, let's say it's coming from somewhere. I'm still going to learn a linear classifier. And we, we actually proved some theory on this. And in fact, this is what we are doing in real life because we don't know where the data is coming from and whether it's linearly separable. But we are trying to learn it, say, with a linear classifier. So we show that uh, if you are OK, not consistent, but you know, you approximate the training data, you're still going to do OK as a function of your empirical error. So what we're going to, but, but still remember that we, we did not, we extended only the first argument. We did not extend the second argument. Why didn't we extend the second argument? Yeah? Okay, so one reason is practical. As you say, we can always blow up the feature space and actually learn a linear function, but over a, a richer space. Uh, but still, we're learning a linear classifier. And the, uh, the reason is that we actually don't know how to learn things that are not linear. Well, modulo, we can learn decision trees. You know how to learn decision trees. We can try to learn neural networks, which also do not have this expressivity. But, but if we want to say something about it, sort of limit the capacity of our learner, that's what we can do. Uh, so, and, and the same thing is going to work here, right? So, of course, I can try to learn a general base net, relaxing the second argument. And there are algorithms to do it. There's very little we can say about these algorithms. I mean, we can say that the problem is very hard. And in practice, there's very little we can say about how good is what we've learned. And therefore, we are going to relax, actually, the first one. Just like we did before, we'll say, we're going to say, you know, give me any probability distribution, data sample from any probability distribution. I'm going to learn the best three-dependent approximation for this probability distribution. So you can think about it this way. Uh, this is the space of all probability distributions. And our target distribution in learning problem one is here. Right? It's a tree. It generates data. I want to try to learn it, or something that is close enough to it. This is the space of all distributions. Some cannot be represented as a tree. Uh, and now my target distribution could be here, right? Any probability distribution. Nevertheless, I'm not going to try to search in this red oval. I'm going to still try to search here. I'm going to try to find the tree dependent distribution that is closest to this target. So my search space is still going to be the black oval, even though my target could be the red over. Okay, so that's, that's the problem we're 
we were playing with, and, and notice that it's really the same kind of problem we, saw, we, we addressed when we talked about learning other functions, classifieds. Okay? Questions? Okay, so the only thing remaining is to give an algorithm that does that. And in order to give an algorithm, we have to uh, define a few things. Okay, so this is just um, how we're going to do it, right? Th there's no way around this, right? So the simple-minded algorithm says, uh, for each tree, compute the likelihood of the tree and find the maximal one. We just want to find a better algorithm uh, to do this. And given that we're talking here in this nice picture about the notion of find the best tree or the closest tree to the target distribution, we, we need to define uh, some, um, some distances, some, some technical terms that will allow us to play with this, uh, with this notion. So the first thing we're going to define is a distance measure. We need a distance measure between distributions. If you think about it, uh, for a few minutes, you will see that you can define yourself a distance measure between distributions. Distribution is just a function that ranges between 0 and 1. Let's say that this is the domain of the distribution from here to here. So a distribution is just a function over this. And another distribution is another function. And you can, you know, it's, it's a function with some properties, right? It integrates to 1, but that's it positive function that integrates to one. So you can easily define a, dist a distance measure between these two, right? You can look at the difference, maybe, the absolute value of the difference in each point, sum them up, it's a distance measure. And in fact, there are many distance measures, many uh, sensible me ways to define a distance measure. Here we're going to define one specific one, and the reason is that technically it's going to be uh, good to... Uh, to play with it. And the, and the distance is um, actually not a distance, technically. It's something that is called the KL divergence for kullback leibler um, divergence. And it defines, it's an asymmetric distance between distribution P and T, and it's defined this way. The distance between P and T uh, is the sum over all instances. It's a discrete space assumed to be p of x log p of x over t of x. Think a little bit about it. Uh, it's non-negative. Uh, it's zero if and only if they are identical. Uh, and it's, it's not a distance, as I said. It's not even symmetric. So it really measures how much p differs from t. But that's going to be the metric uh, that we're going to use, it's a very useful metric. Again, if you think about another distance, you will see that a lot of distances are sensible and, in fact, behave similarly in the sense that they grow together and go down together, but they have different properties uh, that are useful for different things. Okay. So the other thing that we want to define is a way for us to, to rank dependencies. So we're going to learn a graph. Our variables are going to be nodes in the graph. And then we're going to figure out ways to place edges in the graph. Very few edges, right? Because if we have n nodes, we just want about n edges. We want it's going to be a tree. So we need to define, decide what edges to put there and what not. So we need a, uh, a way to measure uh, some kind of a metric that will tell us which edge to insert and which uh, edge to keep out. Uh, it turns out that given that we are measuring distances with the KL divergence, uh, the best way to define this metric uh, is going to be something that is called the mutual information between variables X and Y. Uh, and it's going to be defined this way. So given variables X and Y, the mutual information is going to be sum over all pairs, x, y, all values that x and y take, p of x, y, times log p of x, y divided by p of x, p of y. So, so you can, I'm sure all of you have seen something like this before, basically uh, some notion of uh, 
dependence between x and y, x and y right? Because if x and y are independent, what's going to happen? The, the ratio here is going to be equal to 1, so the contribution uh, to the sum is going to be 0. And other than that, it just measures some, some notion of uh, dependence between x and y, so it's a, something that makes sense to do. Um, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the data and measure uh, and, and compute this uh, on the data that we, we've sampled. Okay. So, one thing to think about, in fact, let, let's get to it in the, in the next slide, is how many parameters we're going to learn, right? So, if you want to compute this, uh, I asked you before what happens in naive base, and you said we need a linear number of parameters. What you can see here is that you may need more. Okay, so let's, let's get to the algorithm. So the algorithm is given M independent measurements sampled from some probability distribution P. For each variable, I'm going to start by estimating P of X, right? I'm assuming uh, binary variables, so I'm going to get N numbers. Uh, for each pair of variables, I'm going to estimate P of X, Y and square numbers, right? So already here you, see, you can see the key difference between base and at, uh, naive base and this. And you can also think about uh, the practicality of this algorithm. So in many cases, in many applications, you run, uh, you can run naive base or perceptron or SVM, whatever you want, on a feature space that has let's say, a million features, right? So this happens a lot in applications. What's going to happen here if you have a million features? How many parameters? 10 to the 12 parameters, right? It's quite a few. So even though the algorithm actually is going to be efficient, complex, time complexity-wise, space complexity could be a problem. Right? You have to store a lot of numbers. Even today, 10 to the 12 numbers is a big number. Uh, so a lot of times, if people want to use this kind of, this algorithm specific, specifically for really large domain, eventually they're going to resort to naive base because they're going to prune the space to try to get to essentially a linear number of parameters. But anyhow, uh, this is, uh, for smaller domain, this is certainly... Uh, practical, so, so we're going to keep with that. But it's really important to think about most times we don't think about space. We think about time complexity. But space complexity sometimes is a big issue. Okay, so we computed P of X, Y. Now we can compute the mutual information, right? We needed P of X, Y divided by P of X, P of Y. We can do it now. So we have all the numbers that we need. Uh, now we need to build the base net, or the tree. So we start by building a complete undirected graph. We connect all the edges, and now we have to build a tree on this. So the way to build the tree is we're going to place the mutual information i of x i as the weight of the edge x y. Now we have a weighted graph. And we're going to use uh, a spanning tree algorithm, maximum spanning tree algorithm, in order to find uh, a tree. I'm assuming all of you have seen spanning trees. So either way, I'm just going to summarize here. What do I mean by a spanning tree? I mean a tree that touches all vertices, right? So given a graph, complete graph, I want to find a tree. So just a linear number of edges uh, that touch uh, all the vertices. So, so the algorithm is actually very simple, or this algorithm is very simple. You can find more complex algorithms for this, but this one is efficient enough, just for example. So the way it works is this way. We sort the weights. We start greedily from the heaviest edge, 
and we keep on connecting to this, to the tree that we've already generated, the largest edge we can, the heaviest edge we can, as long as we don't uh, create a loop. If, we, if it creates a loop, we discard this edge, move to the next one. Uh, so this algorithm will create a tree, very easy to see. In fact, easy to see that this is a spanning tree. It's going to touch all the vertices. Uh, and also not difficult to see that it's the maximum weight spanning tree. Now, it's not the most efficient algorithm for this, but it's uh, competitive. So essentially, because we sorted, um, it's, it's something like number of edges uh, times log number of uh, nodes, so it's n squared log n, good enough. OK, so that's the spanning tree. So now we have a tree. Uh, now we need to transform it to a directed tree. Uh, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to choose a root and direct all the edges away from this root. OK? So this, at this point, seems an arbitrary decision because there are n roots, and I chose just a root. Didn't tell you how. Uh, but it's clear that once I choose a root, I can direct all the edges away from it, and I'm going to get a direct tree. Right? Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. And finally, now I have a directed tree, I'm going to place the conditional probability tables on the edges. So before, I didn't have this notion of conditional probabilities. Now I know that there is an edge from x1 to x7, directed from x1 to x7. I know which probability to put on it. I'm going to put p of x7 given x1 as my conditional probability table. OK? So, so a lot of this algorithm makes sense, but really I have to justify a few things. So one thing I need to justify, okay, they come together. So the first thing I need to justify is why do I place these conditional probabilities? So everything so far I did with the mutual information, the i of x, y. Right? I use this, you know, to generate the tree. Nevertheless, I get rid of this now, and I place conditional probability of conditional probabilities that I'm computing on the sample. And I want to argue that this is the right thing to do. That's one. Two, I used this mutual information, I of x, y, as my way of generating the tree. Right? So I chose into my tree those edges that have the largest sum of i of x, y, and I need to justify that this makes sense. And three, uh, this, this perhaps seems to be the most arbitrary decision. Once I got a tree, an undirected tree, I told you choose an, a node, direct everything away from it, and that's going to be the structure of your tree. And what I'm going to argue is that it's OK. Any node that you will choose and direct everything away from it <coughs> will give you the same result. So it's interesting, right? So essentially, you could say, well, there are n different trees, depending on which one I choose as a root. I'm going to claim that all these actually give the same probability distribution. And now that you know what does it mean to be the same probability distribution, because we discussed it earlier, uh, you can do this. And in fact, this is going to be an exercise in the problem set that you're going to get. So number three, I'm not going to touch. It's actually relatively simple once you know what you're after. And I think you know what you're after. Uh, OK, so, so I, I do want to justify one and two uh, almost completely. Uh, and again, just like last time, I'm not going to give you complete proof, just like I didn't give you a complete proof for inference algorithms in BaseNet, but I'm going to give you enough that 
the key notions are going to be clear to you, and it's a good exercise also with playing with uh, probabilities, conditional probabilities, and so on, and, and understand uh, this notion of a representation of a distribution. Okay, so I'm going to start this one, and I'm going to try to argue why is this that at the end, placing the conditional probability of the empirical data and the empirical conditional probability is the right thing to do. So here is the game we're playing here. You're giving me, you're, you're giving me a tree, lowercase t. Uh, and I, I'm going to define a probability distribution, right? When it's just a tree and it has no number on it, it's not a probability distribution yet. In order to define a probability distribution, I need to place conditional probability on the edges. And now the tree with the directions, together with the number, uniquely define a conditional probability table, right? A, a probability distribution, sorry. We, we, that's what we said, right? It's, it's the same for BaseNet, right? I'm going to give you a directed graph. I'm going to place, give you CPTs. Now, with the convention that we agreed on, this defines a unique probability distribution. Everyone is fine with this? So you're fine with this sentence, right? So defining probability distribution T is done by forcing the conditional probability along the edges. And I'm, the way I'm doing it is I'm choosing conditional probabilities that are computed from the sample taken from, my, from P. P is the hidden distribution that has generated the data. I'm claiming that this is the best three dependent distribution in terms of the best approximation of P. So, and, and that's what I'm going to argue. So let's assume that capital T is the three dependent distribution that we got according to the tree T. Remember, the tree is fixed now. I mean, I, I don't touch the tree. So we can say that T of X is just product over all data points, over all nodes, sorry, T of Xi given the parent of Xi. I'm just writing it this way, where pi is going to denote the parent. It's a single parent uh, of Xi. I'm going to use this distance metric between P, the distribution that produce the data, and T, the one I'm looking at now, I've generated, uh, as a way to uh, decide if I'm doing the right thing. Okay, so, so this is uh, the distance between P and T. We define it to be sum over all X's, P of X log P divided by T. I'm going to write it this way. So it's P log P minus P log T. Right? Just definition of log. You probably remember that this is something that we talked about a couple of months ago when we talked about decision trees. This is just the negative value of the entropy of P. Right? So I'm going to write it here. Negative value of entropy of, of P. And here I'm just spelling this out. So uh, P of X log, now I'm writing it uh, over all the three, instead of T of X, it's really T of Xi given pi. This is just uh, using the, the fact that it's a tree, right? So what is T of X? It's the product T of X given parent of X over all nodes. Okay, and, and okay, I'm still using the same simple abuse of notation where I don't, I disregard the root node. Okay, so I want to argue that this expression is maximized where uh, this T of Xi given the pi, pi of Xi, what I need to place here is P of Xi given pi. So I'm going to do a little bit of algebra and then... Uh, gets to a stage where, where we can prove this. Okay. This is the same thing. I just, I did this step before, and I did this step before. So, so this is sum over all x, p of x, this sum. 
which is essentially an expectation, according to P, of this. Okay, not yet. So it's an expectation, according to P, of this expression. Uh, actually, and here what I'm doing is I'm just exchanging the expectation with the sum. So expectation of this sum is the sum of the expectation of this. Now I'm going to use the definition of expectation again. What is the definition of expectation? It's basically saying for each data point, data point is x comma pi of x, p of x comma pi of x times the value of this random variable, which is log t of x i given pi of x i. So this is the random variable. And, and let's factor this. So p of x i, comma, pi of x i, I can write as p of x i given pi of x i times pi of x i. So I'm writing one of these in this product, p of x i given pi, I'm writing here. p of pi, I'm writing here. Notice that. I can separate the sum. The sum is over xi and pi of xi. But p of pi does not depend on xi, so I can write p of xi here, and p of pi x, the sum over pi of xi outside. So I, I did two things. One is I rewrote the joint as a product of this and this, and the other one is I split the sum. Okay. So now I'm arguing, so what do I have here? I have the following expression. I care only about the internal part here. I have a sum of P of something, log T of the same thing. And I'm arguing that this sum takes its maximum value where the argument here is the same as the argument here. I'm not proving this, although you can prove it. There is some hint in the notes of how to prove it. It's essentially an entropy term. Uh, but if you believe that this expression takes its maximum where t is equal to p, we prove what we wanted. Right? We prove that the right value to put on the edge that leads from xi to pi of xi is the empirical value p of xi given pi of xi. So we proved one. Right, so we prove that it's okay, or it's the right thing, to put the conditional probabilities, the empirical conditional probability, on the edges. The next thing I want to prove is that we did the right thing by using the information gain uh, as the weights. So remember that all our algorithm was guided by this information gain, or mutual information, between x and y. Uh, now, this is an expression that we developed before. Just reminding you, it was here, uh, this one. Essentially, we wrote the distance as entropy term, uh, sum over all uh, nodes, sum over pairs, xi parent of xi, p of xi comma pi, log p of xi given pi of xi. Uh, so notice that I can write this this way. The conditional probability p of xi given pi, I can write as the joint divided by pi of xi, so this divided by this is just this guy. Okay? Again, the numerator divided by the right side of the denominator is identical to this. What I'm doing is I'm dividing by p of xi and I'm multiplying by p of xi. So I'm dividing by p of xi and I'm multiplied by it, but I also use the fact that it's log, so I took it outside. Okay? So now what is this? This is really the mutual information that we define between x and its parent, right? So I can write it this way. So 
I'm taking this. Remember that this is going to be the mutual information. Before that, I'm first multiplying. I'm taking this equality and I'm multiplying both sides by the joint probability, p of x comma pi. So I'm multiplying it here, I'm multiplying it here, p of x, and I'm multiplying it here. Okay, so what do I get? Remember that I got this expression. So now I have that T of PT is the entropy term that I had here. And now I'm replacing this, which is just this, with this expression, the right side here. So what I get? I get the mutual information term replaced by this. And I'm getting a term here that again, requires a little bit of algebra, but because I'm summing over pairs, xi, pi of xi, if you do the algebra, you can marginalize out all the pi's. And what you get is just sum over x, p of x, log p of x. This requires a little bit of uh, algebra, this step, but notice uh, this. The important thing is that once I do this, what do I get? I get that the distance between the two distribution has these three terms, but only the middle one depends on the tree, on the structure of the tree. The other two depend on P, but not on the tree itself, which means that uh, minimizing this is equivalent to maximizing this guy here, the, minimal the, the, the middle term here, the only one that depends uh, on our structure, which means maximizing the sum of the edge weights, which is the sum of the i of x, y. Okay? So again, what I argued here is that guiding the algorithm with this mutual information is the right thing to do because I, I want to maximize the sum of j, the edge weight. This is what we did with the maximum spanning tree as a way to minimize the distance between T and P, which means the T that I got is the best approximation to P. Okay, so just to summarize, we showed that T is the best three approximation of P if we choose it such that it maximizes the sum of the edge uh, of the edges weights. Um, so the cool thing about it, what we've done so far, module the third step that I'm going to just give you an example for, uh, is that we found the best tree without considering all the trees, right? So we gave actually an efficient search algorithm. Uh, over the space of all trees uh, without touching all trees. Really an efficient algorithm, which is nice. We can only do this for trees, unfortunately. In fact, for forests. Uh, uh, but what I presented here was for trees. Um, and really, that's, that's what we did, right? We, we found, uh, we transformed the problem of finding the best tree to the problem of finding the heaviest tree under some definition of heavy, specifically by placing mutual information on the edges of the graph. Okay, questions? Yeah. The edge weights are i of xi, the mutual information. So it was this. Let's just go to... So I defined... For any two variables, x and y, I have n variables. This is how I do it. Right? I compute the empirical joint, p of xy. p of xy means if it's a Boolean variable, I actually have four numbers. Right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And I'm counting how many times each one appears, and I have a probability distribution. 
and I do the same thing for P of X, and I do the same thing for P of Y, and I'm computing this for every two variables. And so now I have a number for every two variables. I'm going to give a numeric example in a second. But now, now that I have a number for every two variables, that's what I place on my graph, and that's the input to my maximum spanning tree algorithm. Okay, so I, I take the graph, I have a number on each edge, this is the number on the edge that connects X and Y. I generate, I give it to the maximum spanning tree, I get a tree, and that's it. So, uh, let, let's go over the, my next example and, and then see if that clarifies things. Okay. Okay, so in this step, as I said, choose a root variable and direct all the edges away from it uh, is, is one of the problems in the, in the coming problem set, I think, that is going to be out today. Um, and in fact, it's the, the, by far the easiest step of the three, uh, but still good to, good to be able to write it down. Okay. Uh, so this algorithm, as I said, learned the best three dependent distribution, the best three dependence approximation of any probability distribution. I don't care what's the source distribution. Uh, uh, so this algorithm was actually an old algorithm. It's called the Chaolu algorithm, discovered in, the, in a different context as, as a data compression algorithm. Uh, and was adapted by Judea Perl to BaseNets when he wrote his book on BaseNets. Uh, really good book that uh, I, I highly recommend. Uh, and since then invented a few more times uh, and generalized. But this happens uh, often. Okay, so let's, let me give an example and, and let's see if this clarifies uh, things. So, so I, the data, P, uh, that I see is three data points. Happens to be the same three data points that we had before. I'm going to learn a tree. So that means that I need to estimate parameters. First of all, I need to estimate for each variable. I have four variables. I call them A, B, C, D, right? The coordinates, X1, X2, X3, X4. Now it's A, B, C, D. Uh, P of A, I claim it's two-thirds. You agree? Three data points, two-thirds is P of A. P of B is a third, P of C is a third, P of D is also two-thirds. One, one, and zero. Okay? So I have this. I have, now I have uh, to find parameters for each pair of variables. Okay? So for each pair, look at A, B at the top here. Uh, there, the distribution that I'm uh, estimating is really a distribution over four values, right? So when I say P of AB, really, I mean P of AB being 0, 0, P of AB being 0, 1, P of AB being 1, 0, P of AB being 1, 1. In all the algebra that I did in the previous slides, I didn't say that. I just thought P of AB, but hopefully we are mature enough to know that that's what we mean, right? So it really represents four numbers, uh, and these are the numbers. So I'm writing it here this way. So for 0, 0, I'm claiming that the probability is 0, uh, because if you look at A, B, they are never 0, 0 together. Okay? For uh, 0, 1, this is the order that I define. For 0, 1, I claim that it's a third. So 0, 1, yeah, 0, 1 is here and it's the only case out of three. And it's one zero, two thirds. One zero here, one zero here, not one zero here, so it's two thirds. Okay, so hopefully I didn't make a mistake here. And for each pair, A, B, A, C, A, D, and so on, I gave you four numbers, and that defines the probability, the pairwise distribution. Okay, now I needed this because I need to compute the mutual information, which is P of AB divided by P of A divided by P of B. Okay? Really, um, what I need is I need log of this 
times P of AB. That's the definition. Log of this ratio times P of AB. I'm cheating here, and I didn't do the log so that it will still be nice numbers, but it doesn't matter. I mean, all you care about is numbers. So I'm claiming that, again, this is uh, a number, uh, an expression that has four values. For 0, 0, for 0, 1, for 1, 0, for 1, 1. So I wrote the four values here, and you can check in this order, the 0, 0, 1, 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So these are the four numbers here. And then I computed the i. This is the place I cheated because I didn't do the log. So now you have all the numbers that you need, okay? N square numbers. In this case, it turns out to be uh, basically uh, six numbers, okay? Number of edges that we need. This addresses your question. So now I have all the I, now I, uh, now I can generate a graph. Uh, okay, this is just to remind us the expression that we used, but we remembered. So, so now I have a graph, and I have a complete graph over four nodes, right, six edges, and I place these numbers. I run uh, a the spanning tree algorithm, and you can run it, and you will get a tree. Now, this is an undirected tree. I suggest that you do it and look at the undirected tree that you get. And what you have to do now is to direct it, and you have four ways to do it. You can choose A, direct everything away from it. You can choose B, direct everything away from it. My claim is, is that either way, it's going to be the same looks like two n different or four different probability distribution, really it's the same probability distribution. That's what you'll have to do. Um, okay, questions on this? Okay, no questions. So hopefully the algorithm is clear. It's really a very, very nice algorithm because you wouldn't think that it's so simple to find uh, something that has these nice properties. Okay, so... Um, so we, find, we found the tree that maximizes the likelihood. Uh, we, we actually addressed and discussed already what does it mean that we found the best tree-dependent distribution given that the data, we don't know where it came from. Um, now, we did not address how many examples do we need to see so that this tree is actually a good tree. Right? It's the same kind of problem that we had before when we talked about PEC learning or any other learning, right? So intuitively, uh, you are estimating this I of X, Y. You're going to get better estimation if uh, you have a lot of data, which means the tree is going to be better. Moreover, if you have more data, P of Y given X is going to be better Right, so there are two notions here. There's more data is going to give you better structure because you're going to choose the better edges into the tree. And more data, once you have the structure, more data is going to give you better conditional probabilities, which means better definition of the probability distribution. So it plays two roles. And, and you can ask the question of how many examples do I need? And, you know, people have looked at it, but uh, uh, there are some things uh, to do here. Um, okay, basically, again, I'm just going to finish with the question that it's important that you, you think about it all the time. You could still ask your question, why do I need this structure? Why can't I just take the data and answer every query that you have about the data directly from the data? And hopefully, we, we've addressed this several times in this course. You really have to make assumptions in order to support generalizations. And here you can ask me the question, what is the probability that P of A, B is something? P of A being 1, B being 0 is something. You can estimate it from the data, uh, or A, comma B, comma C is something. You can estimate it from the data. You'll get a different number if you estimate it from the tree. But our assumption is that it's a better number. 
because it's going to support better generalization. Okay, questions? Yeah. So, so in general, uh, if you want to learn a general base net, you need, to, just like in this case, you really need to search in the space of all base nets. And unlike trees where, we sh again, we sh we, in principle, we need to search in the space of all trees, we presented an efficient algorithm to do it. There isn't such an efficient algorithm in the general case. So what people do is they uh, look at it as a general search problem and define interesting ways and kind of heuristically justified way to move from one base net to another in this huge space uh, and kind of score different parts of the space so that eventually they get to something. So people are doing it. If you go to a textbook on base net, you'll see that there are algorithms to search in the space of all base nets, um, very little is known about what are the properties of what you learn. You learn something. It's an algorithm. It's going to end with a decision, but it's not clear uh, what can you say about what you learn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as I said, you, you take, you have a graph of four nodes, A, B, C, D. You connect all the edges. And then you run the spanning tree algorithm on it. The spanning tree algorithm is going to eliminate or keep some of the edges. It's going to be a tree. Right? So A, B, C, D, which means you're going to have three edges only. Out of the six edges, you're going to stay only with three which their sum is the maximum over the weight of the edges. That's going to be a tree, right? Because it touches all the vertices. Let's assume the tree is from A to B, from B to C, from C to D. That's a tree. So... Here is my algorithm. We are at this stage. I computed i of x, y to be the weight on the edges, and then I built a maximum weighted spanning tree. Once I'm running this algorithm, I have a tree. Did you? So once I have a tree, I still have to do two more things. One is to direct it, and two is to make it a probabilistic tree, which are these two bullets. So you can take my example and continue with the other two steps, which is direct it, place the conditional probabilities. Other questions? Okay, so have a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you after the... Vacation. Are you? Are you going to have? have yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going. Right yes, right now. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. Oh. Sure.